Good afternoon to all of you who are joining us from India and a very good morning to those of you who are joining us from Europe. Welcome to the European Research Day 2021. My name is Samrat. I'm uh, the country coordinator for Euraxis here in India. The European Research Day is one of Euraxis annual flagship events which takes place in different regions across the globe, such as in Australia, Brazil, China, Korea, Japan, North America, and ASEAN. The India edition of the European Research Day is organized in partnership with the delegation of the European Union to India. And I would like to take the opportunity to thank the delegation and especially the team of the research innovation section for their kind support in making this event happen today. Now, today we will present you with some great opportunities for Indo-Europe cooperation under the EU's Research Innovation Framework Program, Horizon Europe, and also bilateral cooperation opportunities with EU member states. I would now like to ask Tanja Friedrichs, Minister Councillor and Head of the Research Innovation Section team at the EU delegation to give the opening remarks of today's event. Tanja, warm welcome. Please. Right. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Well, on, on my turn, I would also uh, like to uh, welcome everybody and uh, thank the Euraxis uh, team for uh, co-organizing this uh, this event. Uh, it's an important uh, event and um, it's, I can say, I think we can say, uh, Samra, it's also becoming a tradition that we do on uh, annually, and we've done this now for several years, European uh, research days. And we do that, and I think it's important uh, for the audience to understand, is that um, um, it is important that you keep being informed to create awareness about the research and innovation opportunities that there exist between Europe and India. And we do say Europe because the opportunities are not limited to what we have at European Union level, but also individually and collectively the EU 27 member states and the countries that are associated to our program. So the first objective of our event today is always to continuously to create awareness that there is these possibilities of cooperating on research and innovation between Europe and India. But of course, it's not only a question of awareness raising, it's also a question of showing on what we can cooperate together and what are the modalities. And therefore, without delay, I would like, together with uh, Samrat, open the event today to the different presentations that we have. And I have the honor to be the first speaker to present the Horizon Europe program. But I'm sure that also Samrat wanted to, to introduce that, but I'm very short here because I will already be the next speaker. Thank you very much. Well, Tanya, you are, you know, an expert in opening events, but you also become a, a real moderator. And uh, thank you already for introducing um, yourself. So it gives us immense pleasure that the first presenter is Tania herself, who will now tell us about the opportunities for international cooperation under Horizon Europe, with of course, with a focus on the EU, EU India partnerships. Thank you, Tania, the floor is yours. Right. Yes, um, again, uh, thank you very much for Samrat, but especially also thank you that we have an opportunity to present the overall program and the way in which cooperation on research and innovation at EU level and India can take place. And for this, I will present our new program, which is called Horizon Europe. And it is important um, to understand we, what Horizon Europe is, it is the program of the EU 20, uh, 27 member states, but it is open to participation of all countries across the globe. It is therefore a truly international uh, program, and it is also multidisciplinary. Uh, 
it gives you access to the state of the art and the best science that is available and the scientists that are available to engage together on research or to strengthen their research um, career. It is also a unique program, not only because of the volume of uh, 95 uh, billion euro over a time span of seven years, 2021, 2027. So we just started that program, Horizon Europe being the successor to our previous program, Horizon 2020. But it is a program, its uniqueness is that it is also open to participants of third countries across the globe and therefore also to India. And we will explain later how India can uh, participate. A unique feature of Horizon Europe this time is also that it allows for association of, to our uh, program. And association is open to any country in the world, provided that uh, you have a good uh, scientific uh, tr track record and capacity and share the EU values. Another specific uh, uh, characteristic of our program is that we do engage in uh, research and innovation, but that we also are very much aware that in doing so, we should safeguard the EU interests. The vision of that program is that we do fund research on a great number of topics, which I will also share with you in more detail, but all these topics are there because they have to underpin the EU main policy actions and objectives, and those are summarized, but there are many, carbon to be carbon neutral by 2050. Uh, we also have set a very ambitious digital agenda at EU level, Post-COVID, we all want to have healthcare that is much more resilient. And we have also seen that the importance of preserving fundamental values and also that requires further research. And all these topics are reflected in our framework program. We also engage in research with our international partners to achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goals. You have a little chart there, what they represent, the, 50, the 17 goals. Therefore, again, this shows that the whole Horizon Europe program covers a large number of uh, sectors. Research is very important to boost your competitiveness and economic growth and do that in a sustainable way. Also for this, increased research is necessary, which is offered under the program. And of course, to all the global challenges that we face, this in turn requires increased efforts on research and innovation, which is offered in, in the program. But we also need to continuously be aware of strengthening our scientific excellence. And also that is covered under the program. And many actions also to strengthen the European research area. In a nutshell, Horizon Europe has three pillars. Pillar one, which is summarized as excellent science and which focuses on the scientist and developing its research capacity and career. On pillar two is the global challenges and the competitiveness. And what is new under Horizon Europe compared to Horizon 2020 is that we have a whole pillar devoted to uh, innovation. I already mentioned open to the world. What does it mean? That every entity, university, research institute, industry, SME, NGO from any country can join a consortium. So the best is to say it's open, but by default, because we have also seen, as I mentioned in the beginning, that sometimes we need to protect our interest and that therefore not all calls, not all topics might be open or up for international cooperation. But just go from the principle, it's open unless mentioned, and it's more than 95% open. And in more than that, we have so many calls for a huge amount of funding that encourages the international cooperation because we're very much aware that you can't achieve or address the global challenges without uh, international uh, cooperation. How can 
how do we engage in research? This, the largest part is what we call collaborative research and innovation project, which a consortia has to be done. But there's also support for the individual researcher. Um, and I will just briefly go over the European Research Council and Marie Curie actions. Our Horizon Europe program also translates a lot of research agendas that are set in multilateral fora, such as the Mission Innovation, which was a spin-off of COP25 that puts all the efforts together on research to make the um, energy shift, uh, possibly shift on energy possible in view of the uh, climate change uh, or climate change actions. Um, we have, there is the, um, uh, on, on health, there are many uh, important uh, multilateral fora, such as the coalition uh, on um, innovative uh, vaccines, SAPI, uh, on um, um, uh, diseases, uh, several health diseases, and uh, other um, rare diseases or other uh, uh, areas where we set agendas in multilateral fora, where we then say that is needed to address that challenge, and then that is then translated in specific calls. It is the program of the member states and the countries associated to the program. The countries, the 27 member states are listed here. It's always good to, to remember, even we in the EU, sometimes when we list them, we, 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 we have a difficulty to come to this 27. So please have a look at that slide where we list them alphabetically. And also then um, the... Um, Horizon Europe countries uh, associated to the program is a large number uh, of countries, uh, even larger than it was on Horizon 2020. Very pleased to say that, for example, Norway is associated to a program which also bilaterally is very active with India, uh, Turkey is, uh, Israel is, and the United uh, Kingdom is uh, associated to a program which is very good for India since you have a lot of ties with them. So uh, all these countries are part of the nucleus of a consortium to which then we can add partners from the EU, from the associated countries and from third countries. Because a consortium must always include three participants. And if the minimum number of participants have to come from three different EU member states or associated countries, and the entities have to be independent from each other and uh, have to be established in a different member state or associated country. And then in addition to that nucleus of minimum three participants, uh, we can add a, a number of participants that can go to 10. Sometimes you have a network of 20. There are averages. But what is important is that once you have a nucleus of three minimum participants, other countries can, uh, can be added to the consortium of which uh, India. A very specific feature of our program is also that it allows for participation both of the academic and the non-academic sector. And I would say that uh, increasingly so, we do encourage the participation of uh, industry, SMEs, uh, startups, and uh, in, in NGOs. Um, but of course, uh, mostly it is the... Um, universities and research institutes, whether private or public, that will uh, be part of the consortia, but also international European organizations. What is also important when you are looking at opportunities and preparing for um, a proposal is that um, you have to identify for yourself, am I more in a research action and innovation or am I immediately already more into an innovation action because I have already 
knowledge development that reaches TRL level six to eight, or am I below, then it will be a research and innovation action. And also uh, often we do support what we call coordination and support actions, which allows to support, create networks, to learn each other, to create uh, joint agendas or policy dialogues on research and innovation needs. Um, and I have put here the funding rates, but that is, um, so if a university or an um, industry does participate in a research and innovation action, it would be funded up to, it would be funded 100% by the program. If it's an innovation action, which we consider closer to the market, it would be funded 70%. But I have to immediately add to that funding that we have to make a distinction between our program being open to the world so you can participate and getting funding. And in the case of India being an emerging economy, just like participants from industrial countries and the BRIC countries, and also um, recently Ch China, uh, Chile, you are not automatically funded by Horizon Europe. And therefore, Indian entities, you who listen today to us, would have to bring your own funding that your institution would provide, or you have funding that can be made or through contribution in kind, because you have a, a test bed or an area where we can do uh, testing um, or that. Unless, as in the past and the Horizon 2020, the government of India would provide funding to the entities that have been selected in the projects uh, under Horizon uh, Europe. But for the time being, we don't have such a co-funding mechanism with the government of India. Uh, for research and innovation, government of India would mean mainly Department of Science and Technology, Department of Biotechnology, and the Ministry of uh, Earth Sciences. Um, so I have to say from the outset, there is no such co-funding mechanism available, but that shouldn't prevent you from getting interested in our program to learn about the state of the art, to see what we are funding, to learn from the type of course that we have, to consider institutional, uh, to consider own uh, funding, preferably at your institutional level, if their budget allow to fund participation in international cooperation, or help us to convince your government that a co-funding mechanism should be established. On a very exceptional basis, there is also funding provided by our program to third countries if we consider that the participation of a given country, a region, is absolutely necessary to execute the pure project. But I have to underline that this is an exception, but it does exist and it does exist and, and if it exists, it is explicitly mentioned in the work programs. For example, on space, it has been the case on a previous call on research infrastructure. So now once I have that are the big lines, the vision of the program and the modalities and conditions of participation, I would really quickly like to glance over the different topics um, and areas and sectors that we fund. It, it is very comprehensive. It has uh, the cluster one on health. Um, it's a big program. As you can see, out of the 95 billion, we spent uh, more than uh, 500 million, about 500 million on health uh, only. And uh, it has, and that is in the first work programs, 2021, 2022, because we do work and publish our calls to work programs on a very uh, regular uh, basis. Um, and within the calls on health, you will find calls on infectious diseases, mental health, chronic diseases, health impact uh, of the climate change, a, a, a variety of topics that all are of interest to participation of, of India. Um, of, we have a, a very interesting uh, cluster too on culture, creativity and inclusiveness. As I said in the beginning, we find it extremely important that we keep up 
with the fundamental uh, values and principles, and that also requires continuously research on, for example, how to do the governance, uh, how to, um, I mean, all the migration problems that we have in uh, in Europe, how to handle that in, a, in an as humane way uh, uh, as possible. Or cluster three has actions on uh, disaster resilience, so that is a great importance and interest with India, given the coalition of uh, disaster management that uh, India has started. Um, it has also calls on um, infrastructure resilience, how to fight against crime and terrorism. In the cluster four, we have uh, everything that is related to digital industry and space, and we will have the pleasure to um, listen to a colleague from Brussels that will elaborate on several calls that will be of interest to you with respect to the new way of manufacturing or also a lot of research that we do to um, on raw and advanced materials, on next generation internet, on nanomaterials, on quantum. Um, cluster five is uh, on climate, energy, and mobility. Those are the, this is the cluster that would mostly contribute to everything which we call now the, um, uh, the objectives to make Europe carbon uh, neutral by 2050, uh, climate actions, um, therefore um, a, a lot of focus on the renewable energy from wind uh, to solar, to high, um, hydrogen, to biomass, uh, on, on mobility, uh, of course, electrical vehicles, but also topics like road safety, clean transport. Uh, so a, a, a large variety of topics. And that is only, again, I repeat myself, in the, in the work program of 2021-2022. The last cluster is also a, a very interesting cluster and will also be presented to you later this afternoon, so I won't elaborate too much has a lot of uh, calls, uh, topics that it also can contribute to reducing the carbon emission or to, for example, do um, the agriculture of the food processing in a more uh, sustainable uh, way. So the different dimensions uh, of the uh, bio uh, economy. I mentioned to you in the beginning that Horizon Europe has three pillars. The clusters that I presented to you are under pillar two. Then we have pillar one. Uh, pillar one covers uh, the European Research Council, where we do on a regular basis uh, ad hoc um, promotion events. Uh, it also co uh, covers uh, research infrastructure and the Marie Slodowska Curie uh, actions. All these actions aim at strengthening our scientific excellence through the researchers themselves or the infrastructure. And uh, on the European Research Council, we have five different um, uh, schemes. For the time being, there is no uh, scheme open, um, but uh, soon there will be a new call for the starting grants. If you, if you are a researcher or a scientist that is driven by curiosity, you have a good idea, something you want to develop, attached to an institute, or a university in Europe, you can pitch for it. It is really a very competitive but excellent program to develop uh, your uh, scientific ideas. Um, we had also a synergy grant call, but that is just being closed uh, this uh, week. Um, but it's important to know that uh, under that pillar one, we have the actions uh, to uh, allowing for support for curiosity driven research. The other uh, program under that pillar one is the Marie Curie actions where you might be more familiar with and on which we will elaborate tomorrow. But again, it is good that those that can't be present tomorrow are aware that under, it is under Horizon Europe pillar uh, one, that we have funding for postdoctoral fellowships, for staff exchanges, or for doctoral uh, programs uh, through networks. 
important, of course, for you is uh, how can I find all these calls uh, that I've been referring to? And there, there is only one or maybe two ways. Uh, the, the most important general way to find it is the funding and tenders portal. That is the link. You open it. You you put in your qualific your criteria, and you will see if we have calls. What are the deadlines? The detailed conditions of, and modalities of participation. If it is a research and innovation action, an innovation act, an innovation action. The number of participants. How many projects we would fund. The number of uh, um, and and so on. Uh, of course, uh, our access is also on a very regular basis um, uh, announcing calls that are open for uh, submitting proposals and the EU website as well. But the key to find it is, is the best is uh, looking at our funding and tenders portal. Important is, since you will remember that I said you always need a nucleus of minimum three partners and more partners, how will you find partners? I consider that the best to find partners is to use your network. You all already are more or less in international cooperation and engaging with others and see if they are interested and have complementary knowledge and capacity to submit a proposal. We have a very good tool on uh, the Horizon Europe portal, and that is a national contact points. And also a very use, useful way to find partners is to look at quarters where you see who participated in previously funded uh, research projects on, on, on topics that we have uh, new calls uh, open. And those uh, entity, those universities uh, or institutes or partners, you can contact, you can ask their experience on previous participation and ask if they would again uh, make a proposal to the new call and if, if possibly you could be part of a consortia. So in a nutshell, the horizon, a very vast, challenging, uh, but extremely rewarding uh, program uh, where you can find more information on, the uh, on our portal. Um, and these links are provided here and also to our different uh, social media. And on this basis, I would like to thank you very much for attending the session. I see that the number of participants increased by the minute or by the, um, and uh, I hope that it gives you mostly the gist of what this Horizon Europe is, a big multilateral program, multidisciplinary, open to participation of the world in which I really invite you to look at opportunities to engage with Europe on research and innovation to make this planet a better planet. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Tanya, for giving a very good uh, structured overview about Horizon Europe. And, you know, um, it's a really a, a very, um, an amazing framework program as you uh, highlighted the three pillars and it has, for everyone something. So we have today attendees who are individual researchers who are looking for PhD and postdoctoral opportunities. We saw that in the Q&A in the chat. For that, we already referred to tomorrow's session, which will be exclusively on uh, opportunities for students and researchers who are interested, you know, for conducting um, their studies slash research in Europe through the uh, Horizon Europe MSCA uh, program or through um, uh, programs which the EU member states offer for international researchers. So that I think we will definitely cover um, all tomorrow. Today, the focus is of course done on institutional collaborations between Indian entities and European. And here, uh, one of the questions which came um, in was on um, the public private partnerships here. Like can private entities like startup, SMEs, what are their chances to participate? And you know, um, what are the success rates here for that? Like, this is very much, of course, encouraged also, right? That there should be like uh, um, interdisciplinary, but also intersectoral uh, partnerships. Over to you, Tanya. 
I think I lost you. Ah, okay. Can you, can so, you repeat? Uh, yeah, public private partnerships under Horizon Europe, like uh, the, is that a possibility and how important is that also when you are applying for calls that you also have partners in the industry and can Indian private entities also participate? Yeah. Okay, sorry, sorry, I got. Well, well it's very important uh, in the sense that um, we want to address global challenges. We want to find solutions. Our program is solution driven. We set a problem, you have to find a solution. We believe that you can't find a solution without also involving industry, SMEs that can then test your the ideas of the academia. So public private entities in the same consortia is really very important. And that is a very specific uh, uh, characteristic. We can't, it's not compulsory. It's not an eligibility condition. We leave a lot of freedom to the best consortia. But if you read the text of the call, and if you have to come up with a solution because we set a problem, you will identify yourself that yes, it is important to also have the industry on board, and that will help you in a positive evaluation. Public and private partners can be both from this EU 27 member state associated countries and all the other countries. So that means that also an SME, an Indian SME can be a partner in a consortium, and you don't have to line up with an Indian academia to do that. As such, an Indian industry is also eligible to participation. Is that yeah. addressing yeah. the issue? Yes, yes, I think so. Yeah. Uh, very clear, Tani, on that. Uh, another question was about, uh, you know, as you said, uh, the, the program is looking at solutions on a global scale. So uh, participation of uh, so-called third countries like uh, India, in, are very much welcomed, right? And secondly, the focus of the research, uh, does it have to be only focusing on the European Union or can it also be like both regions and, and focusing only on India, uh, let's say, for example? Yeah, th th that is a very good question. And that's a tricky question, but, um, and it's a question I had to face like during my five years being here in India, why would you like to cooperate in a multilateral uh, group? We have a lot of calls. If you look at the call text that are what we could call uh, Eurocentric. And we do engage in research and innovation to make our own uh, house more competitive uh, and uh, resistant, resilient and all that. But still, I would argue, not all calls do that. Uh, some are really uh, reflecting very much an international agenda. But even in calls that are, uh, that you would view as an outsider, as Eurocentric, you could say that by you participating, you could gain from it. Because what is engaging together in research is to uh, exchange best practices, knowledge, uh, scaling up a technology. If that can be by being in a, in a consortium with Europeans that want to contribute to that challenge that we have stated for Europe, but India joins, you, you acquire a lot of knowledge that in turn, as an institute, a university, or an SME, you can use and deploy in the Indian market. So it all depends a little bit if you look at it dogmatically or with an open mind. Legally and in terms of eligibility, you can participate in all these calls. And uh, of course, you have to pay your participation. Therefore, a first reaction would be, why on earth will I contribute or participate in a consortium that has to make Europe more competitive? So no, I'm not gonna do that. But think a bit further. You, in, in, in working with institutes and universities in Europe that are 
committed to make Europe more competitive, you can learn a lot for India. So that is how you can also view it, but you need to also make it clear in your consortia what could be your contribution uh, and added value to your participation. So it's a bit more longer term and remote, but it is possible. Um, and of course, the call text, the content of a call is set by our member states or program committee. Uh, therefore, um, it will, unless we, we draft together with India a call text well in advance, the call text itself will not necessarily say that the, the call has to have an impact in India as well, or it will not um, uh, uh, fund research on topics which are specifically uh, territorial India. And I would like to give an example, but don't uh, just to illustrate that. And uh, uh, also myself, I'm not totally uh, certain if it was a right decision, but when we did some uh, possibly looking at uh, electrical vehicles, uh, there was a discussion if we should have a call on um, e-rickshaws and <laughs> because that could be something for the Indian market. Um, and, and, and that was, for example, seen as not a topic that should get attention or funding by us uh, under the, the, the program. But there, besides that very speaking uh, topic, there are so many topics that are across uh, the country is uh, very international by uh, definition, and you have to look at the at the calls and your contribution more in increasing your knowledge and your capacity, and not uh, short sighted on on a very specific topic. Um, I would say, and that is also the design of our program. Great, Tanya. Thank you so much. Uh, I would say we move on to our next uh, presenter. And if there are questions coming in uh, to Tanya, we will also try to address them uh, during the session. But uh, I would now like to welcome our next speaker, Mr. Nicolas Delianakis, sorry for maybe mispronunciation. I will try again, Nicolas Delianakis, Policy Officer at the Director General Research Innovation on Industrial Transformation Unit at the European Commission, Brussels. A warm welcome to you, Nicolas. Thank you for joining us. And he will talk now about the uh, EU's uh, uh, tools for green and digital manufacturing under Horizon Europe. Thank you very much uh, for uh, this welcome. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, or good morning, as the case may be. Uh, would you like to, uh, me to put my presentation on the screen, or uh, will you do it, Tanya? You asked me uh, to send it to you. Yeah, it's uh, as you like, Nicolas. You can share it from yours, or if you want, we can do All it. All right. Let me, uh, let me share my screen. Please uh, give me a second. I'll open it uh, here first. Uh, open it now. Uh, so while it is opening, uh, uh, I'm going to say a few words uh, about uh, cluster four digital industry and space. Uh, which uh, is uh, uh, one of the six clusters in the second pillar of Horizon Europe, the pillar that deals with uh, uh, the global challenges and with industrial competitiveness that are, of course, very closely connected. And in particular, I will talk about the uh, green and digital transition uh, support, the support for green and digital transition in the cluster. Um, so let me see if I can share it. Is this working? Yes. Uh, just have to put it on uh, on yes, the full screen. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Good. Uh, right. So. Uh, very, uh, very briefly, um, uh, Horizon Europe is an impact-based program. So everything we do in Horizon Europe uh, addresses some general and specific impacts. That is very important to know. 
uh, when you make uh, proposals. Uh, so in uh, uh, particular, plus the fourth digital industry in space supports three of the four so-called key strategic orientations of the strategic plan for the first four years of Horizon Europe. Uh, and these are to uh, promote an open strategic autonomy, as we call it, for Europe. So it is, yes, it is about autonomy, but it is also open. I won't say too much about that. Uh, by uh, leading the development of key digital enabling as well as emerging technologies and value chains, very importantly. Uh, the next one, which is uh, a key one uh, here, is to make Europe the first uh, digitally enabled, circular, climate neutral and sustainable economy. Uh, and also, and this is uh, a bit more surprising, it's about creating a more resilient, inclusive and democratic European society. Uh, and that is the contributions of cluster four there are to do with the human side. Now, uh, again, briefly, you see on the left these three key strategic orientations, which are served not only by this cluster, but all the others in different ways. Uh, and on the right, you see uh, a kind of map of uh, cluster four. It has six so-called destinations. The destinations are essentially impacts, uh, uh, the broader impacts that are expected. So the various topics uh, where you can apply or you can uh, submit proposals, uh, are fall under one of these six destinations. Uh, so you see some of these destinations are more digitally oriented, uh, but the first two are primarily um, uh, the, uh, reflect uh, the industry part of the cluster, although this is a slight simplification, oversimplification. So the first one is called Climate Neutral Circular and Digitized Production, Twin Transition for, for short. Uh, and uh, the second one is called the Digitized Resource Efficient and Resilient Industry or Resilience. And this uh, about uh, raw materials, advanced materials uh, and other support for resilience. So, so those two destinations in particular uh, work very closely together. And these are the ones I will focus on. Um, uh, the uh, other destinations are also of much interest, but we don't have time for these today. Like the, uh, the first two, they are mostly open. Uh, and uh, as you can see from the titles, they address the, uh, the digital side more explicitly, uh, as well as space. Um, these are the budgets for the first two years of the work program. So we have now in place a work program for 2021 and 22. Most of the topics for 2021 are now closed. So I will talk today briefly about the opportunities in 2022 in those two destinations, climate neutral, circular and digitized production and increased autonomy in uh, key strategic value chains. Um, the, uh, uh, as you see, these have a budget of uh, se about 700, 770 million each for two years, so roughly half of that for 2022. Um, the overall budget of cluster four is uh, just over 15 billion euros over seven years, and that includes uh, a budget that goes through three joint undertakings uh, addressing digital technologies. Uh, but the, the figures you see in the table are what we call the programmable budget, the, the figures that are available to spend through the work program, through topics to which you can apply. The topics of the joint undertakings that I mentioned just now are also open, but I will not be talking about those today. Now, um, behind cluster four are a number of very important European uh, priorities. Uh, policies. Uh, one is the European Green Deal, and the other key one here is uh, what we call a Europe fit for the digital age uh, or digital decade or digital compass. Um, so, uh, 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 and of course, we serve the European Circular Economy Action Plan strategy for chemicals um, uh, uh, and, uh, and so on, as well as the recovery plan. Uh, all those links are uh, live, so if you're interested, you could follow them and learn more about the underlying European policies. 
uh, in the international dimensions. Now, in, uh, when it comes to uh, sustainable technologies, to green technologies, uh, Europe does have a lead in both research and innovation, as we see from uh, these data, uh, which, of course, we want to sustain, but very importantly, we want to do so in cooperation with the rest of the, of the world, especially when it comes to, to greening. So the two goals are, of course, not incompatible. Um, one uh, key uh, part of the philosophy is to achieve, um, uh, to achieve a situation through uh, research and innovation, but not only, whereby we live within the, uh, the, the uh, boundaries of our planet, uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, we, uh, uh, we do not allow people and societies to fall in the middle whereby they do not have enough resources. Uh, this, is, uh, um, this idea is called the donut economy. Uh, and, uh, and the topics in cluster four, uh, but also elsewhere, uh, reflect this. Uh, I'll give two examples of, uh, of the uh, R&I goals within the first two destinations uh, of Horizon Europe, the clean, green and digital transition uh, and the resilience. Uh, the first one is about uh, secularity. It is hubs for secularity, uh, enabling industries to uh, coexist so that the waste of one may be the uh, raw materials, the secondary raw materials uh, of another. Uh, and uh, there is a lot of support for that, starting uh, the foundations were laid in previous framework programs, but now there is concerted support to do this. Uh, and again, there is quite a lot of work behind this for which I don't have time now, but I invite you uh, to look at some of these recent results. The other example comes from the area of advanced materials. Uh, and here, the, uh, overall, uh, the overall approach is to develop advanced materials as safe and sustainable by design, not as an afterthought. Uh, so we are looking for advanced materials that on one hand fulfill various purposes, like materials for energy or for health, for batteries, for, uh, um, and so on and so forth, but which are safe and sustainable by design. So there is a lot of that in the second estimation of cluster four. Um, now, much of cluster four, but also other clusters, relies on so-called European partnerships. These are partnerships between uh, the public sector, the union, European Union, uh, in, and industry uh, to, spend, uh, to, uh, to spend on certain priorities together. Uh, I will not uh, uh, go into the different mechanisms of, the, of doing this, but uh, the, uh, basically uh, the idea is that uh, the union prioritizes certain areas in its work programs or through joint undertakings. Uh, and um, these are the Article 187 that you see here. But, uh, and in uh, the industry uh, matches those efforts in uh, one way or another, whether uh, uh, in kind or through future investments. And you will find uh, several of these partnerships uh, within, uh, within Horizon Europe, uh, within the cluster four of Horizon Europe. Uh, three of those partnerships in particular uh, sit, if you like, in destination one, the twin green and digital transition. And they're about, essentially about industry. But made in Europe is for the manufacturing industry and distresses zero waste, circular and digital manufacturing. Processes for Planet uh, is about the process industry and it uh, emphasizes the, uh, the uh, zero, uh, zero carbon uh, emissions and as well as a circular economy. I mentioned an example just now and also clean steel, which is very closely related and has uh, uh, similar goals, but is separate for various technical reasons. They are also partnerships on digital technologies like photonics, AI, uh, and uh, so on, that you will find in the other destinations of cluster four. 
The important point is that the topics, uh, the co-program partnerships have topics within the work program, which work just like any other topic, anyone can participate. Uh, and the joint undertakings, the last uh, four rows that we see here, uh, have separate work, uh, work programs, but their topics are also mostly open to international cooperation. Um, so uh, uh, these are some more details on the co-program European partnerships that I mentioned now. I will not go into details now, but I leave this for your reference. Uh, and then the remaining slides, I will not go over each one uh, separately. Uh, the remaining slides are a list of the topics of, uh, of destinations one and two, the green, uh, uh, the twin green and digital transition and resilience, which are now open and will close on the 30th of March, 2022. Uh, so, um, and if you have uh, any questions about the approach as a whole or about particular topics, uh, please come to us and uh, we will uh, try to answer them. Um, now, of course, there isn't enough, uh, enough time, I still, I still want to leave enough time for, for questions. Uh, but basically, you see here, there are uh, topics on manufacturing. These are the topics for the Made in Europe partnership, the digital aspects of the, of the uh, Made in Europe partnership. Uh, the, there is a topic uh, about uh, buildings, the construction industry. Uh, then uh, the, uh, we have topics for the processes for planet, for the process industry. Uh, that you see are about the helps of secularity I mentioned, uh, enabling secularity and uh, eliminating uh, emissions and waste, um, and uh, integration of renewables and electrification. So that's the uh, first destination. Uh, the second destination includes one more call uh, on the uh, value chains related to processes for planet. Value chains are, needless to say, uh, crucial. Uh, and we have seen their importance now with the COVID crisis. Uh, and then we have uh, a number of topics for raw materials uh, and also the sustainable by design, the topics for the uh, materials that are safe and sustainable by design that I mentioned. So all these topics from the first two destinations, the 2022 topics, uh, will close on the third, have a deadline on the 30th of March, 2022, and it is for what we call single stage evaluations. That is, uh, the uh, full proposals are expected, then they are evaluated, and then by the uh, late summer, autumn, the first uh, grants that result from those topics will, should be able to start. So these are, uh, and these are the last two topics that are about the sustain the resilience of EU businesses. Uh, so this is all I had to say. There was I know it's a lot of material to digest. Uh, you cannot do justice to any part of Horizon Europe in twenty minutes. But I hope I gave you an introduction to the to what is behind it. It's something that you will may not be so obvious if you read the work program. Uh, and in this presentation, you will find a number of useful links. And as I said, please do not hesitate to come to us with uh, questions. And now I believe we have some time for questions. Is that right? Yes, uh, we do. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Nicolas. Um, so what, what Nicolas was already mentioning that, of course, it's uh, the, uh, the, the cluster here, cluster four is uh, very huge. And Nicolas managed to you know, pack it in a 20 minutes presentation and give you really, a, I think a very good overview. What are the priorities here and what the EU is looking here for the transition to a green digital future? And you know, what role also uh, international cooperation can play here, especially also of course for Indian entities. And we saw in the chat already, Nicolas, that there are institutions who are working in this field and they are already introducing themselves to others and there is already some networking going on in the chat. So that's already, I think, a very uh, a great news. Um, we, we, I'm just looking in the, in the Q&A. We, we don't have uh, any particular now uh, 
a question uh, what I'm seeing right now. Uh, so I, I would suggest maybe if uh, if Tanya, you would have something to add to to this, give it like the, the a perspective from from your side. Uh, you know, working with Indian entities here for many years. Uh, you know, and seeing what could be the strengths of uh, of a collaboration here between uh, India and, and Europe in, in this area. I think that would be, I think, a nice, uh, if, if Tanya could also, you know, come in here. Right. Yes, uh, thank you, Samrat. But first of all, I was going to, to say the same as you already said, that Nicola did a great job. Thank you very much, Nicola. Good to see you. Uh, and because this is a vast cluster, and it's a, 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 a very important cluster. And it's also a cluster uh, that where there is a lot of potential on cooperation with India. So in fact, what I would, and uh, there was a mix of actions uh, that Nicola pointed out, partnerships, and, uh, but also very concrete uh, calls of proposals that, uh, are opening now, so it's perfectly time uh, to um, to get involved into it. But um, Nicola, if you could share a little bit your practical experience also with Horizon uh, Europe with our Indian uh, friends that are listening, the program is so vast, and you have identified so many interesting calls. Where to start and where to end up? Uh, <laughs> Um, that is a question that I always feel that the Indian um, participants have. And uh, do you think, sorry that I put a question in fact to you, that do you think that there are calls or topics that are more apt to international cooperation than others? I don't know whether you listened to a previous question where which I took the risk to reply, but you know, we have increasingly a number of calls, and especially in that cluster, European competitiveness, strength of all knowledge. Uh, so how do you see international participation in all these calls that you have presented? <laughs> yes, Tanya, in fact, I was, uh, I was there uh, when you answered, and uh, I think it was a great answer. I couldn't have done it any better. You were absolutely right. Uh, so, Let's, uh, uh, I, as you said yourself, in terms of eligibility, virtually everything is uh, is open. Uh, uh, that you already know. Uh, you will see that in cluster four, um, international cooperation is explicitly encouraged in some topics, and uh, such topics do include topics in the process industries and manufacturing. Sometimes particular countries or regions are mentioned. But in any case, uh, the, uh, even when it is not explicitly encouraged, uh, it is uh, uh, welcome. Um, and uh, of course, the consortium, the consortium as a whole, would have to address the, uh, the uh, objectives of the topic, the so-called uh, expected outcomes. Uh, and, uh, Tanya also explained that very well. Uh, and of course, those expected outcomes are to a large extent about Europe. That is not uh, surprising, uh, but that does not mean that others are excluded. So I mentioned in passing this concept of open strategic autonomy, which may sound a bit strange when you first hear it, uh, but uh, I, I, I think it makes perfect sense. So yes, we do want to have key technologies in Europe. Uh, but we want to uh, both to develop some of these technologies and to be able to use them with other regions, uh, especially when it comes to the greening, which is needless to say a crucial issue. You don't need to tell you that. So international cooperation, it goes without saying, is vital there. It's a question of survival, isn't it? Uh, so for all these reasons, um, there, there are ample opportunities uh, in, uh, in Horizon Europe and in particular the topics are outlined. So even if you don't see the word international, uh, you can assume it's there. There are some exceptions, but uh, in uh, cluster four to do with uh, space and quantum, 
uh, they have received quite a lot of press coverage, but these are not the ones I cover today. Um, uh, and they are very much the exceptions rather than the rule in, uh, in the whole approach of Horizon Europe. Um, need I say anything more? We, no, we I, have think, well, I, I just think that without coordinating too much, I'm happy that we are um, in the same uh, wavelength. And uh, I also hope that from today, you will also be convinced that the participation of India in a number of these topics in this twin transition, greening the economy to processing, manufacturing, and also uh, digitalization, uh, those are two topics in which uh, participation of INIA is an added value, not necessarily and only for Europe, but for the world. And uh, that is the design of our call. So I would encourage our Indian uh, audience to be ambitious and to, 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 to participate. Um, you will already learn and make connections to submitting a proposal together. And there may be collateral uh, collaboration stemming from that. You have to know that in any event, uh, we have a very uh, um, low success rate because our program is so competitive because we are really a calling upon state of the art. So per definition, whether it's India or Europe, you have to submit and you have to be prepared for failure if one can consider failure not being selected in the first time, uh, but also in preparing a call, in getting uh, familiar with the partners or in such an important call, that in itself already you will learn a lot. Um, so, um, yeah. Maybe I could add that some areas uh, are actually doing a, a bit uh, better in terms of oversubscription than others. So process industries in particular is not badly oversubscribed. Manufacturing is, uh, and uh, but the process industry that, uh, is uh, relatively, because we ask for, we're quite specific as to what we need perhaps, uh, and because we encourage large projects on, for example, hubs for secularity, uh, we see uh, fewer proposals and uh, better success rates. But that doesn't mean that you should not uh, attempt anything and everything within uh, Horizon Europe and Cluster 4. Yeah. Well, I would say thank you so much, uh, uh, Nicolas, uh, for your intervention and, you know, uh, joining us uh, in, uh, in the morning hours from Brussels. Uh, and uh, we will share your presentation, of course, with the participants, uh, if you agree. And, uh, you know, there will be, you know, more uh, opportunities then for the attendees to go more deeper into these uh, different uh, sectors and areas of Cluster 4. Thank you so much. And uh, staying you. in Brussels, uh, we Bye -bye, move uh, to Thank our next. Thank you very next... much. Thank you so much. So we stay in Brussels and we go to our next speaker, uh, which is uh, Ms. Natalia Brececina. She is a policy officer at the Directorate General for Agriculture and Rural Development at the European Commission. And she's joining us from Brussels, as already said. A warm welcome to you, Natalia. Thank you for joining. Thank you very much for the invitation and good uh, morning, afternoon to uh, all ladies and gentlemen. Um, I will open my presentation and uh, one second. I hope you see the slides. Yes, um, just have to okay. put a bit, yeah, 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 full screen mode. Yes. Do you see the presenter mode or the? Uh, not. We, we can see the next slide as well. Okay. So I will swap to presenter mode like this. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Super. So once again, um, welcome to um, everyone to this uh, presentation. And today I would like to present to you the research and innovation priorities for 
the next years to make the vision for sustainable food systems a reality in the EU and globally. But before I start with um, explaining what is actually included to support the transition to sustainable agriculture and food systems, um, then I would like to uh, introduce to you a bit the intervention logic of Horizon Europe that we have. So in Horizon Europe, we have the legal base, with the pillars and clusters inside and the intervention areas. And then um, we have so-called strategic plan, which is for four years from 2021 to 2024 and the current one. And this strategic plan starts with uh, setting the EU policy priorities and guided by the EU policy priorities. Then we have the key strategic orientations for research and innovation. And um, um, then for each of the clusters, uh, we have also outlined the main expected impacts that we would like to achieve with the clusters. And these expected impacts are then translated directly into destinations that are included in the different uh, parts of the work program. Um, and then under the destination, we have several topics. So these are RNI actions, call for RNI actions that um, should deliver on the destination. And these topics um, include the expected outcomes and scope. So um, having said that, um, this is more um, a slide that explains actually the terminology that we use. So the EU policy priorities are the overall policy priorities of the European Union, like Green Deal, Farm to Fork strategy, biodiversity strategy, and uh, all others. Then we have the key strategic orientations. This is a set of objectives within the e, um, European uh, Union policy priorities, where research and innovation investments are expected actually to make a difference. And then we have impact areas, which are group of expected impacts highlighting the most important transformation to be fostered by research and innovation. And then we have a set, uh, as I said, expected impact, which are wider long-term effects on society, on environment, the economy and the science enabled by the outcomes of research and innovation investments. And then at the topic level, we have the expected outcomes which are medium term effects to actually um, of Horizon Europe projects such as uptake, diffusion, use and deployment of the project results by the direct um, target groups that should help to achieve the wider long term um, impact, uh, expected impacts. And then uh, we have the expected outputs, which are the project results, I would say. So these are the short term results that are produced during the implementation of the projects. Now, having said uh, that, um, given the substantial challenges that are facing our food systems from farm to fork on all three sustainability dimensions, the economic, the environmental, the social dimension, um, we all agree that um, business as usual is not anymore an option. And to address these challenges, all food system actors farmers, um, but also industry, distribution, uh, horeca, consumers, public authorities uh, need to change their practices and need to adapt um, their behavior. And through the ambitious communication of the European Green Deal, which is a new green growth strategy to um, uh, actually um, um, put our economy on sustainable path, that includes also farm to fork strategy and the uh, common agriculture policy reform. And the, the European Commission has shown a strong commitment to change the way we produce, we distribute, and we consume our food in less than a decade, actually. So more innovative and creative ways are necessary to advance quickly in the right direction. And therefore, it is of crucial importance um, to orient well the research and innovation today to help actors across the food system to progress towards the sustainable future. And um, thanks to the targeted investment that we did already in Horizon 2020, we have already achieved a lot, but 
um, in the next years, um, we need to step up our efforts. And therefore, under Horizon Europe, we earmark around 9 billion euro under cluster six to research and innovation supporting Green Deal priorities in agriculture, food and bioeconomy. And we have already launched the first work program for 2021 and 2022 with um, close to 2 billion euro uh, ready to support the best scientific inquiries and innovative ideas to make our food system sustainable by 2030. So now it is my pleasure today to present to you the RNI priorities that we have actually set for the first years of Horizon Europe with the focus on the topics that are now open um, for the application um, and for submission of proposals to actually support the farm to work strategy. So what are our current overarching, let's say, priorities or the expected impacts that we have set in um, the strategic plan under cluster six and that translated also into the destinations under the first work program 2021-22. So what we actually want to achieve, to which destinations we want to get. So, we want to ensure food and nutrition security from uh, fair, healthy, and environmentally friendly food systems from farm to fork. And this is um, directly supporting the farm to fork strategy. Then we would like to achieve climate neutrality and adapt to climate change impact. This is in line with the climate action ambition um, of the Green Deal. Um, then preserve and restore biodiversity and ecosystems. And this also goes in line with the biodiversity strategy from the Green Deal. Mm, manage and use natural resources in sustainable and circular way, supporting also the bioeconomy and the new forestry strategy, and prevent and remove pollution in line with the zero pollution action plan that is just um, published and foster sustainable, balanced and inclusive development of rural, coastal and urban areas. Also supporting here the implementation of the newly published long-term vision for rural areas. And finally, establish governance models enabling sustainability transition while leaving no one behind. And this is supporting all kinds of policies and initiatives like CAP, um, so common agriculture policy, common fisheries policy and others. And um, as uh, um, you see one of the destination is directly corresponding to the farm to fork strategy in, and to get um, um, actually um, I would like to refocus now the presentation on the topics that are included in this destination, but also showing you that across all the other destinations we have also included topics that are relevant for supporting the transition to sustainable food systems. In this destination, on fair, healthy, environmentally friendly food systems from primary production to consumption, we have specified the overarching, let's say, expected impacts into three uh, more operational expected impacts that we would like to achieve. So um, we aim to achieve, um, to enable sustainable farming systems, sustainable fisheries and aquaculture, and also transform food systems overall for health, sustainability, and inclusion. And the challenges that are actually facing the food system span way beyond the EU boundaries. Therefore, the EU also promotes a research innovation, international research and innovation cooperation, supporting the transition to sustainable food system at both bilateral uh, level and uh, the global level. And this shows a bit better this. We have organized the topics in this destination under three main heading so enable sustainable farming enable sustainable fisheries and aquaculture and transforming food systems for health sustainability and inclusion as i said the uh, targeted international cooperation and here in the targeted international cooperation there are topics that are covering at the global level so um, calling for um, a multilateral cooperation but there are also topics that are specifically responding to some um, bilateral um, international cooperation that we have established. And here I would like to give um, these two main examples is the um, EU Africa Partnership on Food and Nutrition Security and Sustainable Agriculture and the EU China um, Food and Biotechnology and Agriculture um, um, initiative.
initiative. So, um, looking now on the, let's say, distribution of the uh, 2022 calls, so the topics um, that are open for uh, 2000, in 2022, under the enabling sustainable farming, uh, we have around 80 uh, million euro program uh, then um, enable sustainable fisheries and aquaculture. In total, there is around 40 million euro for transforming food systems for sus um, health, sustainability, and inclusion. There are topics um, of around 57 million euro and targeted international cooperation, 54 million euro. And now, um, in terms of the distribution of the over the different actions that we have, the majority of the actions are research and innovation action. So 15 of the topics that are focusing on developing really new knowledge and innovative solutions. Then four of them are innovation actions that focus not so much on developing knowledge, but really focusing on developing, testing, piloting, um, deploying innovative solutions, and then coordination and support actions, uh, which is one there. And now starting uh, from sustainable agriculture or diving into this, which is actually the backbone of sustainable food systems for farmers, um, the Green Deal in particular, the farm to fork strategy and um, the new cap set ambitious targets and objectives. And until uh, 2020, um, to, to 2030, we have only nine harvests to actually reach these targets and objectives and transition to sustainable farming systems. To help farmers in this endeavor, we have set the priority actions following actually our long-term strategic approach to EU agriculture research and innovation uh, that has um, the goals of the Green Deal at its heart. And um, to be more now more concrete, um, let me give you a few examples of the priority areas of research and innovation that will be key enablers for the transition to sustainable farming system under the destination directly supporting the farm to fork uh, strategy. So there are RNI actions to speed up the transition to sustainable and competitive um, agriculture by unlocking the potential of agroecology, uh, both in the EU and in Africa. Uh, and here we have these two topics, agroecological approaches for sustainable wheat management, and the one that is for international cooperation with Africa, agriculture, um, agroecological approaches in African agriculture systems. Then we would like also to speed up the transition by boosting um, and improving organic farming and boosting the production of the um, EU uh, grown plant proteins and also advancing the digital technologies. And here we have a topic on innovative solutions to prevent alteration of food bearing quality labels. We focus on organic food and geographical indications. And we have a topic on smart solutions for the use of digital technologies for small and medium sized farms and farm structures. Uh, another set of RNI action will deliver new knowledge and innovative solutions to improve plant and animal health and welfare, and thereby also reduce the dependency of farmers on the use of pesticides, antimicrobials, and other external inputs. And um, these are also um, important RNI priorities for them, multilateral and bilateral cooperation with Africa and China. So here we have the topic on risk assessment of new um, low risk pesticides, uh, socioeconomics of pesticide use in agriculture and emerging and future risk to plant health. And for animal health and welfare, we have the topics on enhancing biosecurity in terrestrial livestock production and um, ecology of infectious animal diseases and um, the um, um, International Research Consortium, so support for this on infectious animal diseases. This is a continuation of the international cooperation um, under the Staridas um, um, initiative. And um, yeah, I have signified with this small, um, let's say, um, pictures which are forcing for the multilateral or bilateral cooperation um, specifically, but um, I will close the presentation by um, once again highlighting this. So 
Um, then um, for the next, um, let's say, um, in, in, besides there are also actions in other destinations. So not only in the other destination on farm to fork um, strategy, but um, they are under all the other destinations that actually can support achieving the target of the farm to fork strategy. So for example, under the biodiversity destination, we support RNI actions to foster agrobiodiversity through breeding of organic crops and legumes. Under the destination that is supporting climate action, um, we want to establish demonstration networks of innovative approaches um, to climate smart farming and um, also an uh, international research consortium on agriculture soil carbon. So this is building on the CIRCASA project that was under Horizon 2020, but now we would like to establish a fully fledged international research consortium. That this is uh, for multilateral um, international cooperation. Now, under the destination of zero pollution, we have um, actually two RNI actions on the optimization on nutrient budget in agriculture and EU-China international cooperation on nature-based solution for management in agriculture. And um, these actually uh, should help us also achieve the target re related to the reduction of the use of um, fertilizers and uh, the re reduction of the nutrient losses in um, agriculture. And um, under the designation um, of um, rural um, um, supporting the development of sustainable uh, rural, urban, and coastal communities, we have. Um, an action on smart solution for smart rural communities, uh, which also includes aspects related to sustainability of food. And there is um, another um, under the destination of governance, there are RNI actions to actually reinforce the agriculture knowledge and innovation system, ACIS, um, in um, order to speed up the innovation and the uptake of the research and innovation results that are produced in all the other uh, projects. So there we um, are aiming to establish an EU-wide inter interactive knowledge reservoir and also um, several thematic and advisory networks. And thematic and advisory networks are a bit different kind of projects because they are not aimed at developing new knowledge or innovative solutions, but they rather to um, gather all the knowledge and innovative solutions that are out there already and to translate them um, into knowledge that is ready to be used by practitioners on the ground, by the end users of farmers and, and other actors in the food system. Beyond the work program 2021-22, um, I would like also to highlight that we are we have launched a completely new way of finding concrete solutions for the greatest sustainability challenges of our times, namely the research and innovation mission for Soil Deal for Europe with 100 living laboratories and lighthouses to lead the transition towards healthy soils by 2030. And the mission is anchored in research and innovation, but also spans across policies, in particular the common agriculture policy, and from the very start involves also stakeholders and citizens to work together with us when with each other in the living labs on in developing innovative solution to um, achieve the goal of uh, healthy soils. And finally, in the next work program, 2023-24, we are preparing already now large scale, large scale research and innovation partnerships with um, to say the synergies with the member states and associated countries through um, in the areas of agroecology living labs and research infrastructures animal health and welfare and agriculture of data um, to get actually to the destination of sustainable food system we also need research and innovation to enable sustainable fisheries and aquaculture and um, because they directly contribute to environmentally friendly, inclusive, safe and healthy food systems and also sustainably, pre -pro sustainably produced food from marine and freshwater bodies can and should account for a bigger proportion of our 
consumption. So um, we have several RNI priorities that um, are published in the um, 2022 calls. And here is uh, the integrated um, and sustainable fresh water bioeconomy. Uh, another is about biosecurity, hygiene, disease prevention, and animal welfare in aquaculture and innovative food from marine and freshwater ecosystem, which um, all encourage um, international cooperation. And um, of course, there is also a need for a system approach to improve the insight solutions and governance that looks beyond the sectors and disciplines and embraces the full complexity of the challenges and solutions and also that acts on leverage points where research and innovation can provide impactful solution and that designs pathways for action that deliver on multiple uh, priorities and co-benefits for climate, circularity, health and communities in line with the initiative that our um, colleagues in RTD uh, B2 lead the FOOT 2030 initiative. And these are basically the, call, the, the, the calls that are prepared um, by them, but I would like to um, give you a full picture and introduce them as well here. So, um, in view of the above, um, the farm to fork destination cover the overarching RNI, um, let's say, actions that aim to transform the food system for health, sustainability, and inclusion. And here, um, the initiatives um, look at building alternative, protein friendly, sustainable, and uh, healthy food environments. Um, then uh, there are also RNI actions for food losses and waste prevention and reduction through harmonized measurement and monitoring. Um, we also call for actions to look into the microbiome in food production systems. And also um, there are two actions that relate to, um, let's say, strictly the diet. So one is on integrated surveillance systems to prevent and reduce diet-related non-communicable diseases. And the other action is um, under the cooperation with um, Africa, combating all forms of malnutrition. Um, following, there's also action on, on effective systems for authenticity and traceability in the food system. And finally, on um, African food uh, cities. This is also under the EU Africa cooperation. Beyond um, specifically under the destination farm to fork, also in the other destination, there are initiatives. So, for example, under the destination on um, development of rural, coastal, and urban communities, there are two calls. So, one is on integrated urban food system policies how cities and towns can transform food systems for co benefits. And the second is on social innovation in food sharing to strengthen urban communities' food resilience. And um, then under the uh, destination related to innovative governance, there are two uh, calls. One is on furthering food system science and federating researchers across the European research area and mapping and improving the data economy for food system. And under the next work program, 2023-24, uh, colleagues in RTD are working on large-scale RNI partnership for safe and sustainable food systems for people, planet, and climate. I would like to conclude by um, saying that Horizon Europe um, is open to participation of third countries, including India, of course. Um, you are very welcome. And India can participate in all calls for proposals, but will not be automatically funded by Horizon Europe. And um, there are certain calls that are targeting international cooperation, most of them for the bilateral cooperation with EU, China, and um, Africa, but also they are ones that say that they encourage international cooperation. And here is the list of the 11 topics that I would like uh, to draw your attention to. Um, here is the topic on the uh, International Research Consortium on Infectious Animal D Diseases, the study does, as I mentioned, on emerging and future risk to plant health, on ecology of infectious animal diseases, um, the topic on agroecological approaches in African agriculture system, also, um, the ones that relate to fisheries and aquaculture, so innovative food from marine and freshwater ecosystem, the integrated and sustainable freshwater uh, bioeconomy, 
and biosecurity, hygiene, disease prevention, and animal welfare in aquaculture, and then um, building alternative protein friendly and sustainable and healthy food environments, microbiomes in food production systems, African cities, and um, combating all forms of malnutrition. And having said that, um, these are only, let's say, the calls that I have introduced, it's only a small part of what is actually available in the cluster six work program that focuses on, on RNI to support food bioeconomy, natural resources, agriculture, and environment. And I warmly invite you to have a look into this uh, work program and the calls that are inside there. And actually we have uh, just recently on the 25th, 26th of October had info days um, on the calls for 2022. And we have um, basically presented all the topics in details with um, question and answer session after um, each presentation. So um, these uh, videos are available on YouTube. Um, open to all, so I invite you also to have a look at these videos if you are interested in one of these calls to get uh, more information. But also if you have any other questions, then um, I'm happy to answer here or please submit it through the research inquiry service that we have and then we can also reply them in written. So thank you very much for inviting me once again and um, yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much, uh, Natalia, for a very comprehensive uh, presentation on Cluster 6 and, you know, uh, extremely interesting. And we already did also last year under the Green Deal, some networking sessions on farm to fork, for instance. And I think this is a topic which is relevant, you know, across the globe and especially also uh, here in India. And I think there is already a, a large interest um, in, in this sector. And, um, I was just, we were just wondering the calls for 2022, do you have any indications when they might open? Because I think now would be a good time to start uh, looking for uh, partners or uh, taking part in consortiums who would yes, apply. Indeed. So thank you very much for the question. Um, the calls were open on 28th of October. That's why we had also the info days 25th, 26th to already, let's say, announce it. And the deadline for the application is 15th of February. So now it's really the perfect time to start to team up with the um, other um, potential applicants and to draft the proposals. Uh, that's uh, great. So it just recently the, the calls opened and uh, you already outlined the priorities uh, for 2022 and also for the next uh, work program. Um, Tanya, uh, would you like to uh, intervene here? Um, and, and give an, a, also perspective from, from here, from India, because we already had uh, these networking sessions last year, and I think they were quite uh, you know, interesting. And so, um... yeah, no, certainly. I mean, uh, I would first and foremost like to take the opportunity to, to, to thank Natalia for the very comprehensive uh, presentation. Um, I knew it would be of interest to India, but I hadn't even realized myself it was so rich in diverse topics and uh, possibilities. So that was also for me very, very useful. Uh, maybe we have overwhelmed our Indian scientific community with the opportunities, but that is always the first step. Uh, Natalia has pointed out very several uh, areas under this global uh, or generic uh, agri-food, sustainable agri-food, and uh, you, it's you scientists uh, that know best in which area you have capacity, knowledge that you want to increase through collaboration with Europe, but uh, please, uh, this is only an appetizer that we have given you. You will have to, after this session, click and open the respective calls, look at the conditions, the topics, and they will be even more attractive to you. Uh, we are there to help, it's not easy. And of course, uh, we are not naive. We know that there is no co-fund yet by the government of India, but um, I, I repeat myself from the very beginning, keep looking at these calls because it also shows the state of the art uh, on these various topics that Natalia has uh, uh, um, gone over, uh, over, 
I, I couldn't even imagine myself that this program on that topic went so in detail and in so many topics that daily is addressed here in India, in the newspaper, in the in the discussions, in the meetings. So uh, they all, we, we really have the same concerns. It's really a global challenge. So uh, thank you very much, Natalia. And thank you, uh, Indian uh, scientific community innovators to, uh, to join us in that session and, uh, but, uh, the ball is really in your camp now. <laughs> and I see that uh, Natalia says also yes to that. So, um, yes. uh, yeah, voila, voila. And I would like to wish also uh, good luck to all applicants for, for preparing exactly. the, um, the proposals. And we really count on, on really wide participation in these calls because it's really important that we that the research community um, mobilizes itself and delivers the innovative solutions and knowledge that can help us address all these global challenges that we are facing across the food system from farm to fork. So okay. it's really important, actually. Yeah. You know that uh, sometimes um, they say in India, not from farm to fork, but I'll let the Indians correct me, of course, but they say from um, Farm to plate because sometimes India does not use a fork. <laughs> okay, that's good to know. <laughs> but uh, that was just something that uh, I was told once. But the concept farm to fork is, of course, uh, uh, captures the whole uh, idea of what we want to do. And uh, from that, except that little anecdote, uh, we are on the same wavelength for the overall objective of sustainable agri-food. Uh, Tanya, could you take over because uh, Samrat has some technical problems, so sure. you can introduce the next thank you. question. Or thank the you. Next yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially, uh, well, thank you very much again, Natalia. You have to stay with us. Now we will shift uh, because we, we wanted to use that European research day for um, the opportunities on research and innovation cooperation under the EU program. But EU is nothing without our member states. And we have here uh, all member states that are very active in the bilateral cooperation with India. And therefore, uh, on a first come, first serve basis, uh, uh, we have asked. Uh, member states to, to join the uh, traditional uh, European research days and uh, the first that jumped onto it but we were extremely happy that, uh, that they did was uh, Dr. Srini Kavari, who's the director of the CNRS uh, office here in Delhi and he will uh, outline the um, opportunities that CNRS um, is offering uh, to uh, to India, and uh, first of all, also thank you, Rini, for being to participate in these days. It's been too long due to COVID, and therefore also you will have to refresh my memory and say what TNRS stands for, right? But you will certainly yes. do that. Today. Okay, so on this note, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let me share my screen. And here we go. Uh, do you see my screen? Yes, Srini. Do you see my screen? Okay, good. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, first of all, thanks to your access. Uh, you, can you hear me clearly? Yes. Yes? Okay, good. Uh, Sorry, am I audible? Yes, Rini. Am I audible? Yeah. Okay, good. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Samrat. Thanks, uh, Tanya. Thanks, uh, Philip, also for tolerating with me because we were uh, moving back and forth. And uh, thanks very much. And uh, thank you very much, all of you, for uh, being present here today. And. Uh, uh, I'm extremely happy to be uh, participating in this uh, uh, meeting in this webinar but soon hopefully we will be meeting live what I will what, what I'll do over the next three hours no 30 minutes or 20 minutes 
is uh, to go over the mechanisms of Indo-French science and technology collaboration opportunities and with a focus on student mobility also. And uh, I may go a little fast. If you have any questions, please put them on the chat box. And I'll also share my slides with you. So do not hesitate to type away your questions. The moment you think of France, you would probably think of uh, something like this. Uh, perfume, a Chanel, uh, Chanel, or maybe a good Bordeaux, or uh, even some World Cups that we win. But there's something more than that. I mean, uh, there is something more than even Eiffel Tower. If you probably have read your, you know, if you remember your high school or college, biology, physics, etc., uh, you know Antoine Lavoisier, Andre Marie Ampere, Blaise Pascal, Marie Curie, Louis Pasteur. So there have been absolutely remarkable scientists that have come out of France and have changed the world forever for good. And uh, science is a very, very important mechanism of collaboration in France. And sometimes we also do selfies, by the way. So um, if you have not heard of CNRS, which stands for Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique, or National Center for Scientific Research. If you had not heard about this until today, I can forgive you, but now onwards you know what CNRS stands for. I'll go into the details of CNRS in a few minutes, but before that, um, what I like to do is to walk you through the landscape of French uh, research. France spends a lot of money on science and research, 48 billion euros per year. That's almost 2.2% uh, percent of GDP, our national GDP. 300,000 full-time scientists work in France and 40% in public sector and 60% in private sector. 42% of our students, some of you will be our students, we are, they are international students. And we have high, fourth highest index of the impact in the world and sixth highest patent applications. And we are also involved within European Union, the Synchrotron, Hadron Collider, CERN, you might have heard of these uh, uh, mega structures, very large telescope, ESA, Ariane rockets, CNES, the space research, and Ariane Space, etc. So new national research investment plan is of 25 billion euros. And in addition, uh, we are good, I guess, because we have 71 Nobel laureates in France, including one of the latest last year, uh, Emmanuel Charpentier for the CRISPR research, and a little earlier, uh, the economist uh, Duflo along with uh, um, Abhishek Banerjee, and uh, Gerard Mourou, uh, uh, the uh, uh, physics, and uh, Cedric Villani is a Fields Medal, uh, which is equivalent of Nobel in mathematics. So. Oops, it's not going next. Yeah, um, international collaboration is important for us through various organizations that you will hear about, and uh, I can tell you more about that. Uh, if you have questions, CNRS, CIRAD, INRA, these are equivalent of CSIR, INRIA, INRA, for example, in India, or ICAR, sorry, ICAR, ICMR, these are equivalent of that. And uh, we have uh, you know, 53.1 percent of our scientific papers. I mean, half of more than half of our papers, they come with international collaborations. And for India, we are the sixth after Germany. Of course, you will hear from Philip. Uh, we are the sixth major partner for scientific research. So, what I would like you to remember at the end of my little presentation is these three keywords, three or four keywords, okay? CEFIPRA, I'll talk about that in a second, CNRS, the most important, and Campus France and Institut Francais for all the logistic details, for how to do all the logistic issues like the visa, the staying there and going there, and, uh, staying in the sense, uh, the hostel facilities, scholarships, etc. Now, one or two words about CEFIPRA. CEFIPRA probably is one of the most effective bilateral mechanisms that exist. It is the Indo-French Center for uh, Promotion of Advanced Research. What we do here is to provide uh, research grants uh, for approximately two to three years, depending on the research project. And we have two deadlines. Keep an eye on that. 
and the success rate is quite high actually the latest success rate was eight uh, percent one out of eight projects was uh, were su supported was supported and the funding goes up to 150,000 euros uh, and so this is a significant research program um, if you want more details I'll send you all the details do not hesitate to write to me and the beauty of this project is in addition to the working money the scientists can go back and forth the students go can go back and forth so this is probably one of the very attractive bilateral uh, cooperations similarly if you have industrial partnership in uh, India and if you know a part partner in France, the, we have this 2 plus 2 mechanism, this is called the Industry Academia Research and Development Program. I can send you more details about that and the success rate here is even higher, but you need to have a startup or a partner uh, who is ready to work with you as an industrial partner. So in addition, we provide the Raman Sa Sco uh, Sharpak Scholarship, which allows the doctoral students to spend a few months in uh, in France and uh, this is an attractive fellowship and we have uh, the, the I think the deadlines would be sometime in April because last time because of COVID the, the mobility was a little slowed down or it was absent actually and these are all the areas in which if you are a PhD student or, uh, you can apply for that and even master students uh, can apply uh, depending on the uh, particular cases we will study that. And in addition, we have what we call as the Sharpak Exchange Program. This is uh, for autumn and spring season, and plus the Sharpak Lab, which is a, uh, just to spend some time, the summer time, as if you are doing an internship in summer. These are all very attractive programs that are um, offered by uh, the French government. And uh, another program that I would like you to know is about the Eiffel Scholarship. This allows the doctoral stay in France and very few people are applying from india so look at it you have this is a very attractive scholarship uh, but the french lab has to apply so get into a touch with the french lab and they will help you to uh, do the application process and uh, the calls are open next september so keep your eyes open um, now a few CNRS as I told you CNRS is National Center for Scientific Research and uh, it is probably one of the most prestigious uh, research agencies or research organizations in the world and we do research in practically every domain physics chemistry mathematics environmental sciences biological sciences computer sciences social sciences name it and you have it and we started uh, back in 1939 just when the second world war had been you know just begun but the french did not deter they did not stop because they had initiated this program and cnrs was born 80 years ago we just celebrated the 80th birthday two years ago we are uh, present practically all over the country in france we have more than 1100 laboratories that are spread out throughout france and 95% of our labs they are associated with the research universities. So um, what we are good is also in meaning we have a high number of uh, uh, science organizations NRS with a budget of uh, approximately 3.5 billion euros per year. Uh, more sixty applications they are with in, in collaboration so there is a cnrs we have 22 nobel laureates and 12 fields medals which is the second in the world so we are also first ranked in the european research council this is a Euro, you know the famous erc excellence grants so we are good so look up look up for CNRS operations so Nature Index, second in the Schemago, fourth in the most visible research institution, eighth uh, in public research organizations in terms of innovation and patents. So we probably you had not heard about them uh, despite this uh, achievements, but no one you will know more about that because we have offices practically in all the all the continents and the latest office was opened in Australia and I am the director of the New Delhi Bureau here and actually I'm sitting in the Sefipra office today. 
we in India, uh, the my bureau, CNRS bureau in India, work with all the major research agencies of India, with CSIR, with DST, with DBT, with Indian Institute of Science, and National Center for Biological Sciences, and ICER. And uh, the way we work is through different mechanisms, depending on the level of cooperation that you have, the level of interactions that you have. I will not go into the details of all these um, intricate details of how to collaborate, but please do write to me. Meaning if you want to just initiate a collaboration, you have exploration, you want to consolidate, meaning you already have worked, or you want to make it even more powerful cooperation, that's called International Research Laboratory or International Research Center. In fact, there are examples of all these right here in India because we have uh, research um, projects in um, Delhi and in, um, for example, in, in Pune, in Bombay, in mainly in Bangalore, in Pondicherry, in Madras, and in Hyderabad. These research uh, collaborative programs are working very well and you could be the next, uh, you know, um, PI in these projects. And we have two very interesting uh, research collaborative centers in uh, uh, social sciences too, uh, one in New Delhi and the other one is the very famous Institut Francais de Pondicherry. Um, and two very interesting collaborations uh, in mathematics and these are very powerful collaborations because in these research uh, institutes uh, there are actually all the time some French uh, scientists, the CNRS scientists would be with us and uh, for example there is one uh, Indo-French research lab in computer science in uh, CMI uh, Chennai and one in the Indian Institute of Science which is Indo-French Center for Applied Mathematics and uh, I have also noted uh, the water research cell which has now become IRP but don't worry about the details write to me if you have questions and just say we oui to France meaning say yes to France thank you very much I take uh, the questions if you have any Thank you so much, uh, Srini. Uh, it's very good to have you back in India. Thank you. I know that you are uh, with us. Your absence was uh, very strongly felt. And we also see that in the chat, some of the audience are recognizing you, are happy that uh, you are back. And the you know, same goes for us. And thank you so much for giving us a very good overview on the uh, French research innovation landscape and also, you know, the Indo-French uh, the relationships, the cooperation which is going on. Um, there was uh, one question regarding uh, postdoctoral fellowships. Uh, you talked about master and, and PhD, but uh, yes. also are there any postdoctoral fellowship opportunities under the programs? Yes, uh, they are not under necessarily uh, listed here, but the moment you are a PI, for example, you, your supervisor, if the, your supervisor has a project under SEFIPRA, then there is absolutely a possibility of you getting a postdoctoral fellowship. Otherwise also, if you have identified a laboratory in France, in CNRS, that is uh, you know, appropriate for your research, just let me know, we will explore the possibilities of uh, postdoctoral fellowships. Quite often, the, the PIs would announce those fellowships, otherwise you can contact them through me if you want. Yes, the answer is yes, there are postdoctoral fellowships, but we have to identify the appropriate labs. And also, Trini, you already mentioned it uh, a few times during your talk that, you know, uh, the researchers, uh, institutions can write to you directly if they are yes. looking for partners and if they're looking for programs which would yes. you know, fit their backgrounds. You know, Srini is uh, very available and uh, always ready to help. Yes. And um, Srini, what about the Indo-French Knowledge Summit? I heard something. Yes, going that's on. a very good question. Uh, fantastic. All the listeners, please, please note down the dates 24, 25, 26. Uh, this is an online and so please I will send you the uh, or I'll send through your access we will send the uh, registration please register you have absolutely exciting sessions of Indo-French uh, collaborative possibilities what is going on and some 
brainstorming of new areas of research on practically every branch of science in one health in medicine in uh, uh, in new energy sector in uh, artificial intelligence uh, name it and you have it over the those three days 24 25 26 i'll send you the details and there was a question on social sciences yes because there are uh, there's a particular one particular department of cnrs is dedicated for social sciences so if you uh, identify the area of social science research that you would like to do and you can also apply through the two uh, units that are in within I india you can also get in touch with them and they will be able to tell if you have further questions do not hesitate to write to me I see. thank you so much Sri. Yeah. um i would say we, we move on to uh our next uh, speaker, uh, due to the time constraints, and you already made uh, Philip wait. Uh, yes. Sorry, Philip, my apologies, Ms. Excuse. So, uh, after France, you know, seeing the rankings, you know, top in science, top in culture, top in sports, which country in Europe can match that? I would say it's only Germany. Hey, it can and, do more than matching, it can even do better in terms of football i would say germany is still uh, you know years ahead in terms of world cup titles right philip so let me uh, introduce you to you now uh, our next speaker uh, mr philip von ritter he's the science counselor at the embassy of germany in new delhi and philip uh, a warm welcome to you and we are very much looking forward to hear from you about indo-german research cooperation thank you thank you sabrat thank you um I mean, it's, it's so great to be here, and I think it's very important um, to have these European Research Days, and it's, it makes perfect sense for us to present our um, bilateral programs and offers that we have in, uh, in, uh, as part of, of this European framework. And uh, I have with me Katja Lasche, director of the DBH, uh, who will speak after me, um, after a short introduction, much more knowledgeably about all these programs. But... Um, I think uh, one thing that I, we cannot stress enough is why does it make so much sense to, to have this in a European framework? Uh, and it's great that your access is playing such an important role there. It's because if you are going, uh, if any of those listeners are going to go to a German uh, research institute or uh, do a program with a German research institute, um, it does not stop in Germany. They will automatically be part of a highly integrated uh, research area. And that's the European research area. And, uh, that's uh, something that we should not forget, and that makes uh, Europe and all the research destinations in Europe um, quite unique. Um, and, uh, well, perhaps in, in, in Germany you will not get the same uh, macarons that you will get in, in France. They are much better in France. Uh, and in France you will not get the same sausages as you will in Germany. But, and of course, also for each and every one of you, there will be specific institutes in some European member states that will be the perfect fit. And that's why you should get the most information uh, necessary. Um, but you will be part of that European research area. And uh, this is a, a very, very important uh, European project that is as old as the European Union. And please forgive me if I speak a bit about geopolitics, so to say, but I'm a scientist. I'm not a diplomat. Uh, I'm, I'm a, not a scientist. I'm a diplomat. Um, so why is it so important for us? It's because uh, this global center of gravity, if you want, that used to be in the North Atlantic is shifting to the uh, Indo-Pacific. It's obvious, we all know it, uh, in terms of demographics, uh, industrial output, production of goods and services. Um, the Indo-Pacific will very soon uh, by far outweigh anything that is happening in, in Europe. And um, that's, of course, also why we are all here, why I'm sitting here in, uh, in Delhi, why we are all uh, in India, uh, because we want to build partnerships with India, a key partner in the region. Um, but you can only build partnerships if you offer something also on our side. If you say India is going to be a, uh, a leading power anyway, what can Europe offer? And I am convinced, and uh, thankfully also the European leaders are convinced, that what Europe can offer is uh, to be a global hub for knowledge, for uh, research and for high technology. And uh, that's what this European research area is, is about. And um, that's something uh, I think that to, for you to understand um, why, why uh, we are all in this European uh, prison. And Tanya said, um, EU is nothing without member states, but it's, it's, you can also say the member states are nothing without Europe. And certainly 
um, as a only member state research area, we will not be not as interesting uh, as a uh, as we are as a European uh, area. And uh, that's why we're here, where we are here, where we are um, trying to roll out the red carpet to all the bright Indian minds. And um, I, I can say that for Germany, we have um, hundreds, hundreds of programs from in all disciplines, uh, for all stages uh, of uh, career, uh, research career. And Katia will speak more about it. Only one thing that I want to mention is that we have a very special institute here in Delhi, this is the Indo-German Science and Technology Center, um, a bit similar to the Sifri Pra that um, Srini mentioned. So um, the Indo-German uh, Science and Technology Center, IDSCC, supports um, collaborative projects um, with industry and research partners. So they will be um, uh, projects with an industry and research partner from the Indian side and the German side, uh, quite big, big projects up to uh, 400,000 euros. And uh, the next call will be starting in early 2022 um, on artificial intelligence. So look out there. If you have any projects there and you say, I have um, a uh, research solution that uh, I want to uh, research upon uh, with an industry partner, uh, then this may be the perfect fit. I will stop here and then over to Katja, who represents the DVEH, uh, under which uh, are assembled all the German science organizations here in India, uh, and who can speak much more about the concrete programs. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Philip, for, for handing uh, over. I see also my name now here. So um, I'm Katja. I'm representing the DWIH, DVH, and also the German Academic Exchange Service. And I lead you a bit through the numerous programs we have in place in, um, in Germany. And I hope my screen is visible. Could somebody confirm? Yeah, Katja, yeah. it's visible. Great, wonderful. So um, uh, I will just lead you through, and Philip mentioned if you come to Germany then you come to the heart of Europe and then there's a good opportunity to connect, to cross connect uh, are the European funding schemes in place and there are also French um, cooperation and German uh, cooperation with France and all the other countries. So it's a perfect place to start your research. Let me uh, give you a couple of numbers and then um, my scope today would to indicate a couple of sites where you could orient yourself with regard to the funding scheme games available in the Indo-German context. So here we have a couple of numbers on the German research system, not as big as the Indian, obviously, uh, but nevertheless, 1,000 publicly funded research institutions, and we are one of the few countries matching the goal of the European Union to invest 3% of the GDP in, um, in research and innovation. And you see also a huge sector in Germany, a huge industry, more than 680,000 people are working in the R&D sector. So there is also a place for uh, Indians, of course, and we have a lot of uh, international students and researchers in Germany. Here you just see, and I will not go into details, that we uh, um, still invest and the investments are increasing. The numbers from 2017, the latest, but also over the last couple of years, the investment has been raised in research. So uh, research is important to Germany and uh, we believe that we can't solve the yeah, global challenges on our own. So that's why we are investing also a lot in international relations. Just to give you an idea, if one talks about research uh, in Germany, uh, one always has to look in industry. There are a lot of um, opportunities also there, postdocs position, for instance, available um, at companies like uh, BASF who are running huge research centers. Then of course, the universities and the non-university research institutions, as we call them in Germany. So if you look for opportunities, uh, don't forget the industry, especially if you are into applied research. And here is a number of the international researchers you see we have a lot of academic staff even in universities uh, and in non-university research institutions and guest researchers, 38,000. And I want to mention that amongst these 38,000, there are more than 20,000 international students doing the PhD. And uh, currently, uh, if you look at the overall number from India, we have uh, nearly 30,000 uh, international students, a lot of them doing their master's and PhD programs in, in Germany. So whenever you go to a research institution, you find somebody who has been through the experience and we welcome you. And then you could reach also, also to your yeah, fellows uh, to, to see and to connect with them. 
The research landscape is rich in institutions and also in funding institutions. If we look at funding, we always have to bear in mind that there are funding agencies like the German Research Foundation, the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, and the DAD, as it's known in India. But then the research performing the institutions themselves, like the Fraunhofer Institutes, the universities, the Helmholtz Association, are giving also um, yeah, funds for cooperation, but also uh, are offering individual scholarships for PhD and postdoc uh, researchers it's always worthwhile to look at the platforms at the websites there to find positions. Um, um, just to give you a number, Max Planck is currently hosting more than 4,500 international PhD students in the 90 institutes. And last but not least, not to forget the private and public foundations, Volkswagen Stiftung is very well known who are funding not just individual mobility, but also research projects. Philip mentioned the German Center for Research and Innovation. And I think uh, if you look for support, you have good access in India as we have uh, more than 15 institutions in present and uh, feel free. We have the website at the end of the presentation to reach out to the institutions to ask for individual funding schemes offered, for instance, by the University of Heidelberg, Erwitja Aachen, but also the Fraunhofer Society. So I think it's a good access for, for, in, um, for Indians uh, yeah, to, to have a talk to the representatives, the local representatives who would guide you through application procedures and the offers, the specific offers of these institutions. It's, it's quite unique. You find these uh, yeah, supporters or these structures just in four other countries worldwide. So India has a huge advantage and all of them have uh, segregated and separate funding programs. We as DVH have certain focus topics which we are working on. Uh, we as DVH are not providing uh, funding, but our goal is it to lead you through the funding you know, on all the research schemes uh, in Germany. And you just see here the topics we have been working on over the last couple of years. Public events would encourage everybody to participate in the events activities we are running. It's always a good opportunity to connect to a German research institution, topic specific, uh, and to reach out to them. So if you look and just a few of exam uh, examples, I could talk hours on the German landscape, of course, uh, to give you a few examples of what is out there. And then I come to a couple of websites where you could look for the, for the uh, opportunities available. So if we look at individual scholarships, uh, for instance, at the German Academic Exchange Service, the DAT, so we are offering research grants, doctoral programs, complete full PhD in Germany, 35 scholarships a year approximately, but also there is the possibility to apply for a binational supervised doctoral degree or uh, for an in-region scholarship. I want to mention the specific of this uh, scholarship is that you can choose to whatever discipline you want to go and to whatever institution you want to go uh, to Germany. So this is the unique um, point of the DART funding schemes uh, to choose whatever you want to do. So you're not bounded to certain institutional limits. And these funding schemes are available also for postdocs. Here it would be the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation who would be responsible and offering postdoctoral and senior researcher schemes. We as DAD also have small schemes for researchers available. Uh, two to three months for initiating cooperation and guest lectureships. But as I mentioned, the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation uh, will uh, have uh, yeah, a large portfolio for postdoctoral um, uh, students and for senior scientists uh, who would go to Germany based on an individual scholarship. So we have a bit of segregation of, of work there. Philip already mentioned the Indo-German Center for Science and uh, Technology. Uh, and the call, just to give one example, so um, we have a couple of funding schemes for cooperation in place, so for instance, the German Research Foundation, but also the, the, the DAD, where we foster research cooperation between institutions. One of the current running calls is the open call for Indo-German bilateral workshops uh, by the Indo-German Science and Technology Center. Uh, here you could apply for yeah, running a workshop with a German institution to initiate cooperation and then maybe to work on an application for the two plus two projects just mentioned by Philip. Uh, the next call in the two plus two will be on artificial intelligence. The, uh, German Research Foundation has also call opens, especially in the field of life sciences and uh, mathematics. Uh, and they will open pretty soon uh, also a huge call for so-called international graduate schools. 
So there's a lot of information. I just dropped names here and there. Uh, so where you will find the information starting, hopefully, 1st of December, here's our new portal connecting the portal for uh, Indo-German Research Corporation. What you find here is funding programs. We are currently uploading uh, all the institutional funding schemes available, um, including the European schemes, but also the, the schemes offered by the Indian government and by the German government and the funding agencies. Uh, so feel free beginning of December to have a look and to uh, look what uh, cooperation schemes are in place. So we identified more than 45 uh, cooperation funding schemes. Uh, and uh, the second part of the portal is an overview of ongoing research projects. Uh, all research or PPIs and all people into research have here the possibility to upload their project. And then we will showcase which are the center and the hubs of Indo-German research. So a new portal upcoming where we uh, would like to cluster and will cluster all the information uh, which is out there, but which is a bit scattered. For the individual scholarships just mentioned, here is the database which is run by the uh, German Academic Exchange Service. Here you do not just find the uh, scholarships by the DART. Here are scholarships, individual uh, scholarship schemes available for India, also offered by other institutions, like I mentioned the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. So more than 20 institutions are in that database. So if you look for individual funding, go to this database. Once back, if you would look for cooperation funding, then please uh, go to the connecting uh, portal. And last but not least, I would like to mention uh, the Research in Germany website. Uh, this is a general website offered by Germany where you could look into yeah, uh, career perspectives in Germany, uh, industrial research, uh, how to find a position within industry is one of the topics. You will have an overview on the research funding and on the general funding schemes available in Germany under research funding, but also we have a couple of uh, alumni who take you along the road and will showcase how it is to live in Germany. And we also have information here with regard to visa, accommodation, dual career. What do I do if I want to take my partner with me to Germany and want to look for a job for him here in Germany? So there's a lot of information available on this portal. This clusters all the information from Germany and serves as a kind of um, umbrella. Uh, it's a worldwide portal, whereas VSDV has serving more the Indo-German um, context. And a hint on upcoming events where you could figure out more. Um, we are running regularly information sessions on study and research in Germany every week, uh, up to three sessions. Sign up at uh, dad.in. Uh, there are panel discussions. Uh, we introduce funding schemes. We are discussing um, yeah, how you find your way for, for studying and research in, in Germany. So it's a good opportunity. Uh, maybe one or the other day you could join. And as you have seen, the system is so large and there's so much funding available. I want to draw your attention to the Indo-German Research Day, uh, 24th of February, 2022. Uh, we are going to run a large virtual fair. More than 25 institutions will present their offers. You have the opportunity there to yeah, connect with them, uh, talk with the representatives in one-to-one -one meetings. And we will also run some discussions on yeah, uh, policy topics like open access, I will discuss science communication and uh, gender. And we also have a couple of panels uh, for funding schemes where uh, we have people from the funding agencies who give a yeah, look um, behind the stage, let me put it in that way, uh, on selection procedures and, and so on. I would leave it here and uh, yeah, to be able to answer questions here, you find the uh, website. And uh, I started with the wonder of you uh, to the Brandenburger Tor in Berlin, I finished. Uh, with our parliament uh, to, to an outlook. France has the Tour de Eiffel. We have the Brandenburger Tour, but I think uh, this day is wonderful in a common um, European spirit and showcases what we as European Union, as uh, Europeans um, can do. And uh, would also like to highlight uh, that uh, we see cooperation always bilateral. It's not just about attracting talent to, to Germany. It's about cooperation and it's uh, yeah, to having a partnership abroad, be it together with our Indian friends or with really with our uh, French friends, of course. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, uh, both uh, Katya and Philip, uh, for your interventions. And you know, you split it up very well, um, Philip, uh, from you know giving the more uh, large perspective of you know the um, Indo-German cooperation, but also the importance of, uh, of uh, the European research area. 
and Germany's uh, role in that. And then Katja coming in with a very consolidated uh, presentation on the different uh, opportunities for collaboration, both on institutional level, but also on individual level for uh, researchers and students. So I think that was a, a very, very informative. And one can see also that, you know, uh, the Indo-German cooperation is very strong and you are also like, you know, you're keeping the ball rolling with a great events. You know, you already have the Indo-German research day coming up at the beginning of next year. And also let me congratulate you on this upcoming portal, uh, which uh, Katja, you mentioned will uh, be, be launching soon. And I think it's, you know, it's a fantastic uh, initiative and, you know, it, it gives such a great uh, access to information on ongoing uh, projects on possibilities for opening calls, uh, bilateral. But I also wanted, like, we wanted to know a bit about the multilateral dimension, of course, since it's the European Research Day. So, like, if Indian entities are interested to participate in Horizon Europe calls, you know, and looking for German partners, both uh, private and public sector, like, how, how would they go about that? You know, like, like, do you have any kind of links for them? Or is there, uh, you know, are there, like, um, contact points uh, to, to, to contact for that? to identify partners who would be willing to participate under a Horizon Europe project with India and like German institutions. Yes, there is the national contact points in, 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 in Germany. And then there's called COVI, which is a contact point organized by the research institutions. And I know that COVI, and that's quite interesting, has a list uh, of open postdocs position for ESC Marie Curie. So people looking to host somebody under the European funding schemes. I think that's really important. And uh, also if you apply to uh, European funding, they would be there even for international uh, applicants to guide them through the application procedures and interview procedures for ESC. Um, and if you look for a partner, there is not a real database uh, um, available. So that's, that's unfortunately uh, nothing we have, but I really would recommend to go to the German research directory. I just put it in the jet, which is Gerrit, uh, as we call it. So this is a, the research directory, 25,000 entries. What you can do as an Indian institution is to search there in your field. Uh, and then to see if uh, and to find the partner and it's not just the university level it goes down to departments and the individual researchers and then maybe reach out to them and uh, I'm quite sure they would apply in the funding schemes we are yeah we have we are doing quite well in the European funding schemes but as I said unfortunately there is not a database uh, where the open um, or open call would be would, would be available but as I said uh, I'm quite confident that uh, if you would reach out to a German institution find a partner that they would be aware of your keen scheme and would be involved in one or the other. Uh, thank you, Katja, for that. I think both France and Germany have a, a very strong engagement and participation in the European research framework programs. We have seen it in the past with Horizon 2020, but also Horizon Europe. And, uh, you know, these are just two countries out of uh, the 20, 27 EU member states, but they're also associated countries uh, in, in Europe, which, uh, uh, you know, parties can uh, uh, be partners uh, for uh, where Indian entities can be partners of consortium. So there is a lot uh, of, of potential out there, and um, I think uh, if we have um, there, there are some uh, questions re regarding PhD fellowships, uh, Katya and, and, and Philip. But I think uh, you know there's quite a, a good information on on your websites, and there's also possibility to contact uh, the DART office, right? Uh, um, and you and we will also be able to share your presentation uh, with the audience, right, uh, Katya and Trini. So then, then I think uh, you know there is uh, much more uh, better opportunities for for the audience to interact with our speakers through email, uh, because we are also, of course, coming to uh, slowly to the end of uh, I think a, a very uh, interesting and, and fruitful uh, day. Uh, day one, uh, and we will continue with day two tomorrow, uh, same time, and looking much forward, of course, to have uh, all of you who joined today also to come and join us tomorrow on where we will specifically focus on, on student and research mobility programs under Horizon Europe, but also with member states uh, uh, of the EU. And um, I would say um, we come to, uh, now slowly but surely to the end of, of today's session. And I would really like to thank all our partners, speakers, and of course our dear audience for making this a, a really successful afternoon. And I would say today's event shows with so many of you attending that the Indo-Europe uh, partnership is very strong in research innovation. 
it's already great, but there's a lot more potential and scope to enhance uh, this partnership between India and Europe, isn't it, Tanya? No, ab absolutely. I mean, it's um, it's great to see always the increasing interest uh, in research innovation, in cooperation, engaging, connecting, as Katya underlined so much. Uh, and then, of course, from our point of view, preferably between uh, India and, and Europe. And I would also like to pick up on one point that you mentioned, Samrat, is, uh, but, uh, that is really that Horizon Europe, the EU level program, is a gateway for the Indian scientific community to be uh, to go to a specific member state as well. And that is something sometimes that is uh, forgotten because if we promote, and you, I saw a great interest, but as you said, that will be discussed tomorrow, the possibility of doing a doctoral uh, degree or a postdoc or working as an individual uh, scientist, that has to be always attached to an institute in Europe. And that's where you found today really incidentally, Germany and France uh, together, uh, but that shows also how beautiful the beauty of Europe, uh, because they, they both offer fantastic uh, um, research institutes and universities uh, that, can, that can host you. I don't know if Philip is still listening to me, but I would see, uh, argue between Le Macaron and the Labour Cooker. So uh, that's two very good uh, European biscuits, uh, and I wouldn't have compared cookies with sausages. So, <laughs> and I see that Philip, uh, it catches his uh, uh, attention. Uh, but that was just to end also, because as, as some writer always says, science cooperation also has to be fun. So we try to also keep up a little bit of humor uh, among us uh, in the family, isn't it, Samrat? Thank you so much for this fantastic day. Tanya, as I said in the beginning, um, I think the moderation will go over to you now, from now onwards. <laughs> uh, you're, you know, you're, you're really, um, you know, getting to it now. And it's great to have, you know, these sessions always together uh, with the EU delegation and your team and, you know, with Vivek and Kinshit and Tejin. They're always an excellent and fun, uh, uh, you know, um, time we have. And uh, we will continue tomorrow, as I already said. And once again, thank you so much to our speakers, Srini, Philip, Katya, and all of you who have joined us today and, you know, looking much forward to seeing you tomorrow again. Same station, same place. Okay. Bye-bye, everyone. Namaste. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Danke. Tschüss. Tschüss.